My name is Ayalu Taferi. I'm a professor of medicine and a consultant in hematology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I am here to talk about an article that's going to appear soon in the Mayo Clinic proceedings that myself and Professor Tigiano Barbui from Italy have written on essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera. This article is an update on the current state of affairs in these two diseases. Uh, we try to provide some information, uh, new information regarding diagnosis, disease prognostication, and treatment. In terms of diagnosis, the main thing is some discussion about the upcoming change in the World Health Organization criteria and mostly the importance of confirming a diagnosis of essential thrombocythemia since it can easily be confused with a diagnosis of polycythemia vera or early forms of primary myelofibrosis. The upcoming changes in the WHO criteria have been discussed and proposals have been published and they're currently in the public domain and primarily uh, they inform the readers that a patient with essential thrombocythemia has to be clearly distinguished from another patient which might mimic essential thrombocythemia because their hemoglobin is not high enough to call them overt polycythemia vera or the bone marrow has not been carefully reviewed to exclude the possibility of early forms of primary myelofibrosis. In other words, bone marrow examination is very important to confirm true essential thrombocythemia and distinguish it both from masked polycythemia vera and early forms of primary myelofibrosis. In terms of prognostication, in both diseases, advanced age, history of thrombosis, uh, and high white count uh, suggest shorter survival, probably a reflection of a different disease biology. However, these clinical prognostic models uh, are going to drastically change very soon uh, based on our work and others who are currently looking at the introduction of next generation sequencing and trying to genetically risk stratify these patients and complement the clinical prognostic models with some genetic information. In terms of treatment, it is very important uh, to recall some recent publications from the International Working Group on Myeloproliferative Neoplasms Research and Treatment, whereby we used very large cohorts of retrospective patients uh, and defined the contribution, the additional contribution uh, of cardiovascular risk factors and the JAK2 mutation to uh, established risk factors such as advanced age and history of thrombosis. We now know that the usual low-risk patients, which are usually defined as young patients without a history of thrombosis, can further be risk stratified into very low risk if they are JAK2 unmutated or just low risk if they are JAK2 mutated. This is very important because in very low risk disease, that is to say, Jack to unmutated essential thrombocythemia without cardiovascular risk factors, one can possibly skip aspirin therapy, whereas the presence of the CV risk factors require that we place these patients on aspirin therapy. And if these patients have more than that, meaning that they are Jack to mutated, which puts them at an additional arterial risk or risk for arterial event, then they might require twice daily aspirin therapy. On the other hand, in the high risk group, we are finding out that patients with thrombosis 
have a much higher risk of thrombosis compared to the high risk patients whose high risk status is defined by advanced age. We are also finding out that this high risk status defined by advanced age is the one that is more affected by the presence of JAK2 mutations. Therefore, there might be a chance to risk stratify the conventionally high risk patients into intermediate and high risk category, whereby the age defined high risk would be just intermediate as long as they are not JAK2 mutated, whereas anybody with thrombosis history or older patients that are JAK2 mutated would still be called high risk disease. Obviously, all these things need to be looked at prospectively and the treatment modification also have to be validated in properly designed prospective studies that have controlled arms. But until then, hopefully the guidance that we provide uh, in this article will help, help patients and their physicians. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.